cities. How urban studies envision the new era of the metropolis. Edgar Peterson, University of Cape Town. When the Berlin Wall fell, I was active in student protests at the University of the Western Cape in the dying days of the vicious apartheid state and felt profoundly emboldened. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Another applause. Stand up, please. Everyone up straight. Your feet flat on the ground, arms straight. So now you've got to wiggle your fingers, but not your thumbs. Just the fingers, not the thumbs, not the thumbs. OK, great, fantastic. So that in Africa is how we do cloud services. So you've just offloaded all of the information of today, and it is sitting in the cloud, conversing with the ancestors, and we can get on talking. Please sit down. We can get on to talking about urbanization in Africa. Africa is going to be, it is already, the fastest urbanizing region of the world. And in just one generation, we will double the population uh, across the continent. The problem with this is that as we speak, most of the urban Africans are living incredibly precarious lives. They are not provided for, the governments are failing them, and we don't know how to deal with the growth rates that we are seeing in a context of large-scale neglect. So one of the aspects that is absolutely clear is that we've ended up in this situation because we've got an absence of leadership. There's simply no vision, and there is no perspective on how we can collectively, across our cities and societies, build this vision. So what I want to propose today is that in the context of recent global discussions around a new kind of economy, around sustainability and so forth, is that within this, we can make a case for what sustainable urbanization might be. And it is this vision that I believe is the critical breakthrough that we have to achieve. So I want to build the argument by suggesting to you that most of the development economists that our governments and, and we all listen to are probably right, that urbanization generally speaking, historically, is a good thing. Because what we know is that in most world regions, you don't, you're not able to reduce poverty, you're not able to deal with large-scale problems in the absence of urbanization. Secondly, we know that in urban contexts, it's much easier to provide the basics. And when you get the basics right, you improve labor productivity, and this also is good for the economy. We also know that in cities and in urban areas, you've got an agglomeration of knowledge institutions, of firms and individuals, entrepreneurs, and the coexistence, the proximity of these actors mean you get innovation. And this is great for the economy and it's great for novel breakthroughs. So what you see is this virtuous connection between rising productivity of firms, of labor, and households. And because of this coexistence, you get spillover effects and you generally see an improvement in the well-being. Now, the puzzle is that this does not apply in most of sub-Saharan Africa. So in 2015-16, we did a large piece of work with the OECD, with UNDP, and the African Development Bank, and we tried to build a more disaggregated understanding of the differential patterns of urbanization across the continent. And what you see from this table is that in only five countries with diversified economies, do you see fertility rates below at three children per household or less. In all other contexts, we are not seeing a reduction in fertility rates. Now, this is not the only metric that we should use. Another metric is that the large proportion of urban dwellers live in informal settlements. And this proportion is much higher in the African region than in all other global south regions. And in some of our most populous countries, like Ethiopia, the Congo, and so forth, up to 75, 80% of the population live in these conditions. Now, it is not just informal living. We also know that most of these households and people in them, they live in, they work in informal and precarious employment. So research done by the ILO suggests that 63% of Africa's labor force are trapped in precarious employment. Now, just 10 years before, when Africa started its growth spurt and was growing at average GDP growth rates of around 5 to 8, 
it was 65%. So in a decade of aggressive growth, we were only able to reduce the level of precarious employment in the labor force by 2%. So what we see as an outcome of this is a very peculiar and specific set of conditions, or what we call the urban form and the metabolic system of African cities. So on the left-hand side, and this is an example from Nigeria, the largest economy in Africa, Lagos, the, its most important financial center. And you see the community of Makoko. 250,000 people are squeezed into the shacks on stilts in the lagoon with zero public services. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. They provide all of it themselves in whatever form and obviously with, uh, as you can imagine, really difficult public health outcomes. On the right-hand side, you see Echo Atlantic emerging out of the sea in reclaimed land, 10 kilometers away. It is catering for 100,000 elite uh, uh, Nigerians and of the international community. And this is the imagination that is fueling infrastructure investment in African cities. And even though that is privately financed, all of the connective infrastructure to connect that to the rest of the city has got to be provided by public money. And what that does is it sucks away the limited infrastructure investment resources we have to fuel a fantasy about what the African city could become. Now, that is a generalized condition in most large African cities. But for us to be able to solve these obviously unacceptable trends, we've got to go to the root causes and think, to, why is this the case? What has happened here? Why, why have we ended up in this situation? And one of the reasons, clearly, is that when independence happened in the post-colonial period, we realized that the new political leadership institutions simply adopted all of the racist, exclusionary colonial planning norms and made it available for themselves. And what you then had was a situation where a duality got encrusted in the urban form. So a small elite is able to live the convenience of a European ideal of a suburban life, and the vast majority, by fiat of regulation and law, are consigned to illegality and effectively suffer state neglect. This then manifests in the situation where the small elite, if you will, are deeply vested in a kind of consumerist exhibitionism. They drive in their four-by-fours from the gated community to the shopping mall, to the mega church, and of course to the airport, and then they are able to maintain this bubble whilst the vast majority of urban dwellers have to, if you will, produce in a makeshift way the real African city. Now, this, in our work, we've typified to be blunt and to the point as a kind of slum urbanism. And you see the symbiotic relationship between the auto-constructed city, where the majority of urban dwellers live, making the city through their sweat and toil, and this elite enclaves. And this produces a very unique and complex set of dynamics where formal, informal, planned, unplanned, governed, ungoverned, coexist in an entanglement that is very, very hard to legislate against or to resolve in that way. So, to really get to the heart of this, it's important to understand what these interrelationships are. So if we take the fundamental problem of an underinvestment in core urban infrastructure, what we see is that this means there's very limited and uneven basic services. The effect of that, in developmental terms, is poor health outcomes, poor educational outcomes, and stunted social mobility. What then happens is that you get the emergence of these makeshift cities, hybrid service delivery solutions, which of course means that as these cities grow, demand always outstrips supply. What does that produce? Competition, naturally. What does competition produce? It produces fragmentation of social capital and an erosion of social cohesion. Now, This in turn means that you've got, over time, a stunting of human capital development, which means most of the people in these cities are then trapped in precarious low-wage work. What happens as a result of that? Household incomes remain depressed. So in this condition, you can imagine, this is fantastic breeding ground for a kind of clientelistic politics, 
which means you've got a recipe for exactly the problem that started the cycle. And we are trapped in this. And in each city, in each town, this takes on a unique, peculiar manifestation, which requires research on its own terms. We can generalize the pattern, but we don't know the specificities. So in this context, what I want to propose is that if we take the global discussions, research from across the continent, very important political processes that are slowly starting to emerge, we can frame sustainable urbanization as a device, as a framework for setting a vision about how we can both engage with the reality of African cities and incrementally, in a radical way, but incrementally begin to transition to an alternative. And I want to give you a hint of what our debates are across various epistemic communities across the continent, but what some of the building blocks of that might be. So in the first instance, we've got to recognize that the convergence around the SDGs, the COP agreement, a habitat agreement which produced a new urban agenda in 2016, is that the sort of centerpiece between all of that is that the mechanism to effect this is to embrace the imperatives of a green economy. Within the green economy lies an opportunity to use this critically needed infrastructure to effect or to catalyze that transition. And so what does this mean practically? It means that across the continent, we're seeing that sustainable infrastructure is, interestingly enough, in spatial terms, lends itself to a kind of deconcentration, a decentralized model of city making. Now, that's great news. Why? Because most of the communities in these cities who are attending to their own service delivery requirements operate on relatively small scales. So there's a spatial alignment between the possibility of off-grid solutions, as is the case of MCOPA in East Africa, and in various other examples that I will very briefly cite for you. Another example that is fascinating in South Africa, where the minibus taxi system, which is a 16-seater, has emerged as an organic response to the absence of effective public transport. And we're now on the cusp of Uberizing these vehicles so that we can begin to deploy them as effective responses to sprawl-driven, sort of low-density urban environments. Now, of course, that's not a great thing. We should try and densify, but the point is, while we're sort of en route to that, we need to see how we use these organic responses to begin to deal with it. Another example is from Atare in Nairobi, Kenya, where youth clubs originally emerged to try and attend to the sanitation and the waste problems in the neighborhood, and over time have been able to see the potential for new recycling and energy generation businesses. And these social enterprises are absolutely mushrooming in the region. Finally, we see across many, many African cities the emergence of a connection between the possibility of highly localized, small plot food production and nutritional needs in schools, using these communal gardens in school grounds as part of the curriculum of these schools so that children get a direct connection to the production process, to uh, the various aspects going on there. And this creating a context within which people are beginning, if you will, at a micro scale to explore bio-based solutions to key urban infrastructural questions. Now, what is fascinating about all of this is that it demands from a management, a planning, and a coordination perspective, a localized decision-making structure. And this is important because what it creates is that by attending in an alternative way to the fundamental problem of a lack of basic services, it creates an opportunity for a new political imagination and set of institutional practices where these circular economies at the grassroots scale creates the platform for neighborhood level decision making, planning, and governance. And this is fundamental, I believe, to the possibility of a fundamentally different kind of politics in Africa. A politics where decentralized service delivery is in fact the gateway to citizens realizing their power, using that power to contest the terms of urban incorporation so that you can begin to look at the larger city budgets, the money spent by the parastatals, and to see the connection between expressing that as citizens and attending to their localized solutions. <coughs> now, within this framework, what we see is that decentralized models have enormous potential, but we should never forget the fact that the one wall that has to fall is citywide investments 
in regional infrastructures around renewable energy, integrated transport, and universal ICT access, which in fact, interestingly, unlocks a set of fiscal resources that allows us to sustain a different set of logics for how infrastructure will work. And finally, we've got to recognize that none of this is possible unless we are able to see the emergence of a new kind of leadership on the continent, a leadership that is adaptive, that is able to carry its weight in the world with confidence, plans under their arm, helmets on their heads, and it is a leadership that is able to then draw on the very DNA of African decision-making, which has always been collective, adaptive, and visionary. Thank you very much.